Well, good morning, everyone. It's just so good to be with you this morning and a happy Father's Day to all the dads. One of the things about Father's Day is it gives dads a freedom to tell dad jokes all day. And uh, my favourite two of these, uh, what do you call a camel with no humps? Hump free. And uh, I can hear you laughing. And the second one is this, is that how does a hamburger introduce his new girlfriend? Meet Patty. <laughs> yep, well, dads are laughing and others of you are just going, just get on with it. We're not here to hear your bad jokes. So that's what I'm going to do. I want to say this morning that uh, I'm going to speak pretty directly into the lives of dads this morning. But also I want to say that if you take on a role as a, as a father figure in someone's life, I hope this speaks into you as well. And, but, but for those of you that don't fall into that category, any of those categories, I hope this morning will actually help reveal to you how perfect our Heavenly Father is and what He offers, but also what He requires of us as well um, as, as we go through this this morning. But dads, I really hope you're listening this morning. I, uh, I know that there are a number of differences between Mother's Day and Father's Day. For a start, they say that we spend 37 more dollars on our mums than on our dads. Uh, also, before mobile phones were around, uh, they used to say that Father's Day was the highest day of collect calls because many um, children would ring their dad, but they would uh, make it a collect call. So he'd have to pay for the call as they were wishing them a happy Father's Day. And they also say that, that uh, Mother's Day, there's just so much more money spent on cards and flowers than on Father's Day. But the fact is that no one can deny the impact that a father can have on a child. You know, one of the saddest parts of uh, the society in which we live today is the amount of absent fathers in the lives of their children. Fathers that are not only absent, but have minimal time with their children. Fathers that are too busy to invest in their children. And that's not something that's just not within the Christian circle, it's also in the Christian circle as well. You know, last week we uh, heard from Kevin Gray as he spoke on Kids Hope, and one of the key areas of Key Hopes and the mentoring that goes on through Kids Hope is mentors into children who have no father figure in their life. And when I did Kids Hope for seven years at the Basin Primary School, I had the same child for those seven years, and he had a uh, absent father. His dad didn't want anything really to do with him. So for that one hour, I was in a sense playing that fatherly figure and we developed such a great relationship. But, but there are so many children, uh, young and old, that, are, that have an absent father or have no father figure in their life, despite the importance of that father needed in their life. Now, as you listen this morning, some of you are going, that's me. My dad's absent right now, or he has been absent. Or maybe you're even a dad going, yeah, that don't's already struck a chord with me. You know, James L. Schaller writes this, that the absence of a mature father-child connection creates a void in the soul, an enduring father hunger. Dads, stepdads, Father figures have this huge impact on the growth and the development of sons and daughters, no matter how old they are. Once you become a father, a father figure, you're that for the rest of your life here on earth. One son put it this way, I, I am a self-made man, but my dad drew up of the blueprint. He drew up the plan, which I want to follow. Fathers give children, for good or bad, what no one else can. There's numbers of dads uh, have lessened or even uh, lost their influence on their children. And many times it's because of their own choice. There was a, a, um, a, um, a survey that was done of 1,600 adult children. And more than 50% of them said their father was either emotionally or physically absent as they grew up and continue to be so. 50%. And 
And out of that 1,600, only 34 said that they see their dad as a role model. You know, last year we spoke on Father's Day about our legacy and that we don't have a choice to say, I'm going to leave a legacy or not. And as a father, you, you don't have a choice to say, no, I don't want to leave a legacy. Like it or not, we are continually building the legacy that we will leave, that either people want to follow or they won't want to have anything to do at all. You know, there's a book by uh, uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Ken Canfield, uh, The Heart of a Father, and he, and he cites several uh, factors why dads ignore their role of being a father. We don't have time to go through them uh, in detail this morning, but there's four things that he highlights. He says dads get caught up in their personal needs. They're after seeking happiness for their needs. They become all consumed by their own personal goals. A second thing he says is a loss of priorities. Their priorities, instead of being family and being a father, their priorities become work. Their priorities become golf. Their priorities become riding motorbikes or singing songs, whatever it might be. But anything but being a father. A third thing that he highlights is that as a dad, there is a loss of the importance of responsibility and commitment. They don't want the responsibility. They don't want the commitment of being a father. And the fourth thing that Canfield notes is a loss of community. They don't uh, keep themselves accountable. They don't talk to other dads. They don't engage in conversation about being a father. And one of the great things that I have in my life is, is five really good mates. We've been mates for years now. And one of the things that we talk about is being the role of dads. How we're going, where are the struggles, what are the difficulties? And we seek encouragement, but also advice from one another. I have no doubt, as I speak this morning, that dads that are listening, are on the majority are saying, oh, I do want to be a positive influence. I want to be a positive role model. I want to be an effective father. But, but there are there are numbers of you that are still saying, I'm not sure I, I quite am at the moment. Now, you can go to amazon.com.au, you can go to Kurong, and you can find so many books on parenting and just all these parenting books. And I, I've read some of them and, and they're good, but I've got no doubt as I've been, the longer I've been a parent that I've found the Bible, the best guide for me as a dad. The best instructions, the best learnings have come by by being in God's word and learning from that. You know, the Bible repeatedly talks about our heavenly father, that God is described as our father. You know, in 2 Corinthians 6, it says this, I will be, God says, a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. Matthew 9, 6, uh, when Jesus is asked, how should we pray by the disciples? And Jesus says, begin by saying, our father, which translate, translates Abba, which means daddy, but our father. You know, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, uh, when, when he came up out of the water, it says of the heavenly father, he said, this is my son. With him, I am well pleased. Affirmation from the father to his son. Now, now the most recognizable uh, verse in the Bible is John 3.16. And, and it, it gives an example. It highlights the father and his love. And, and it goes this way. As many of us know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in reading that verse, I think there's some really good things as dads we can learn from. I think there's a bit of a plan that we can take out of that. We can find really helpful and actually apply to our our own lives as dads in these days that we have as parents. And I want to encourage you to write some of these things down so you don't forget. The first thing is this. A father loves unconditionally. It says here that for God so loved the world. And, and as Christians, we know that the way God loves the world is unconditionally. God is love. That is who he is. There are no strings attached. God loves us for who we are. The author, uh, Philip Yancey, he says this, he says, there's nothing that we can do to make him love us any more 
And there's nothing we do makes him love us any less. God flat out loves you. Now, you might be feeling right now and you're watching this going, I feel unloved or I'm feeling unlovely. How can God love me in the state that I'm in? Well, I can only repeat this. God loves you unconditionally. His love is unconditional. I love that passage that that Lance read out of Psalm 103 that reveals the type of love that God has for you and I, that this it's an abounding love. It's everlasting to everlasting. He does not treat us like our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Wow, that's just an amazing thought for me. That's how great his love is. It's unimaginable, such as his love. Our mind cannot get around how great his love is. It's unconditional. Now, when I was a new Christian, um, I used to think, well, God's going to love me the more and more he gets to know me. Or the more I do worthy things for him, he will love me more. And some of us are still maybe even in that trap of that, thinking, well, I've got to do things to please him and he will love me more. But, but God is not like that. It doesn't work that way. Now, as I've understood the unconditional love, I've begun to understand it even more as I've had my own children. You know, when our first child and then Sam and then Haley and then Amy were born, when they were born, I I just totally fell in love with them in a way that's impossible for me to even describe to you. You just fall so much in love with them. They haven't done anything at all. They've entered the world, but you just fall in love and you hold them. I wasn't a real holding baby sort of person before my kids entered the world. But you hold them and you say to them, I just love you, Sam. I love you, Haley. I love you, Amy. And you just repeat it over and over again, not because they've done anything, but they're your child. And you just love them and you love them unconditionally. And it continues to this day, pretty much. No, but to this, you just love them unconditionally. I heard a funny story that there was a story of a wife who found her husband one night standing over their newborn baby in its crib. And silently she watched her husband as he he stood looking down at the sleeping little baby. She saw on his face a mixture of emotions. Amazing. Disbelief. Delight. And he'd stand back and he'd shake his head and he'd just repeat, amazing, just amazing, while smiling from ear to ear. And touched by this unusual display and this deep emotions, his eyes glistened as she slipped her arms around him. A penny for your thoughts, she whispered in his ear. Isn't it amazing, he said, when you take the time and you really look close. How can anyone make a crib like that for $49.95? $49.95. Another dad joke, maybe. But this human love that we have for our children is the best example that we have of God's unconditional love for us. That God's love is not based on performance. It's based on the fact that we are his. You know, I've never met a father who said, oh, I don't love my children at all. I've never come across that. But, but there are numbers of dads who drop the ball in this unconditional love area that they don't get it right from from not t- from not telling their kids they love them that they're not showing it enough to to where they love with conditions and maybe that was you growing up you know uh, I, I love you when you do well on the sporting field i love you when you get a good job i love when you, when you get good grades you know i love you because your room is so clean that 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 there's conditions It's not an unconditional love. And maybe as you listen to me right now, you're going, that's still the case for me. Or even as a dad, as you just think about it right now, you think, that's what I'm like. You don't want your kids believing that there's things they have to do to please you to receive love. 
You don't want them to think, well, my relationship with my dad is conditional love. Again, we go back to the model of the Heavenly Father and his love is unconditional. Let me encourage you by just start by telling your children you love them. Today's a great day to even do that. I've never had a child say, uh, can you just slow up on telling me that you love me? No. They want to hear that. You know, I remember one time maybe that got a little bit prickly for us when I yelled out to Sam one day, hey, buddy, I love you. And he was with his year 11 mates. That, that went a little bit awkward for a little bit of time. But at the same time, I wanted them to know just how much I love Sam. Time and time again, you can read God's word and it reveals his love for you. Google it this week, God's love for us verses, and you will find many that reveals his unconditional love. And just as I finish this little point, I want to encourage you. Some of you, it's pretty hard to love your kids right now, even with some of their decisions that they're making. But now more than ever, they need your unconditional love. It doesn't always mean we agree with what they're doing, but they know that they are loved. A second thing a father communicates his love is when uh, he gives sacrificially. He gives sacrificially. We see in that next part of John 3, 16, 16, Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. As Paul says this in the book of Romans, he said that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is perfect sacrificial love shown. Perfect sacrificial love showing. You know, this is probably a good time just to stop. And if you've got your juice and your bread nearby, I think it's a good time for us just to remember that perfect sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross. Because whenever I think of uh, sacrificial uh, giving, I think of this. This is the first place I go to is what Jesus did on the cross for me in my place there's a beautiful verse in 1 John 4:10 that says this this is real love not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins that this is that he went to the cross for me that the father sent his son his child who he loves to the cross for me. Sacrificial love. God's sacrificial love made known to you and I in the life and the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus. His son's life for ours. Perfect love. And the practice of communion allows us that time to express our thanks to God for that. For that new life that is offered to us because of what? That sacrificial love of Jesus did. You know, Luke 22, uh, Jesus outlined how, how to do communion. And it begins with, with, with gratitude. It says, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took Another cup of wine, and he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you, for Tim Dyer, for you listening today. Within communion there, there is the act of expressing thanks to God for what he's done. So as we take the bread and as we as we drink the juice, it allows us to turn our attention to God with thankfulness. So I just want to pray a, a prayer here and feel free to repeat it silently or out loud. And at the end of that prayer, I'm going to just leave a moment or two of something that you might like to give thanks for. And, and then we'll um, come back to where we're at. But let's just stop and let me pray. Thank you, loving God, for Jesus, who gave his body and life for me. I want to give thanks for what the juice and the bread represent. 
the life that I can experience with you made possible by the body and the blood of Jesus given and poured out for the forgiveness of my sins. For we know God has given his perfect love and he's given it sacrificially through his son, Jesus. But his, his, his loving generosity didn't end at the cross, that it still continues today, that he meets our daily needs, he answers our prayers, he continues to pour out his uh, amazing grace, he gives good gifts, that, that he indeed is a giving God. Uh, where we read in James in chapter 1 where it says in verse 17, every good and perfect gift from uh, above coming down from the Father. Good gifts. And as, as um, parents and as dads, you want to give good gifts, you know. Uh, I've learned over time that one of those gifts that our uh, my kids love is uh, money and being able to buy the things that they would like and those material needs and I hope I would do an okay job and a good balance of that. But one of the, the main thing that they, that I noticed that the kids uh, want, they want, no matter their age, and I still seek it with my parents, is time. Time. And sadly, as parents, that's an area that, that, that we don't get right all the time. You know, they did a, a survey with a group of, of young children of what's the best thing your dad does. And out of those results, it was repeated over and over again that the number one thing that the kids listed that they loved uh, doing with their dad most required their dad's time. It wasn't about uh, a gift. The gift was time. You know, no dad I've ever um, been on a uh, their deathbed or had very deep conversations with have ever said to me, Tim, I wish I spent more time at work. You know, one of my favorite memories with my dad, it was very simple, but uh, pretty much every every week uh, there for a time, he would come out uh, each night and kick the footy with me. Mum and dad would say, how many dishes you wipe would be how many kicks of the footy dad will have with you. So it got me doing the dishes. It worked. It was a real treat for them. But it meant so much to me, just kicking back and forth with dad and him showing me how to kick a football and just doing it with me. But it was his time with me. He had a very busy job that worked long hours. You know, sadly, it's grandma or it's grandpa or it's mum or it's an auntie or it's an uncle that does this, that gives the time, that stops and looks at the flowers and smells the flowers and looks at the, the spiders and reads the books and all those sort of things. Because dad doesn't give the time, or doesn't want to have the time or doesn't make the time. You know, one of the things that I've learned uh, more and more as, as I've grown as a dad is um, actual gifts aren't really um, the thing that my kids really want. What they want most is to spend time with me. And we don't have to be wealthy. We don't have to have lots of um, talents um, to be able to do that. We just have to stop and to be able to think, am I doing this? Am I doing it regularly? Sadly, too many dads these days give little or no time to their kids or well, they give it way too late. You know, one of the saddest um, reports that I read during the week was psychologists who attach microphones to the shirts of kids to record actual parent interaction. And the average amount of daily time each dad spent with these kids was 37 seconds, an average of 2.7 daily encounters of 10 to 15 seconds each. It's just heartbreaking to read that. That's we we are to positively impact our children, no matter how old they are. And we must love them enough to find a way to give them our time. There's a saying that time waits for no man. And I think time waits for no father either. 
to invest in the lives of their children. We can never get that time back. You know, one of the hardest things for me this year is our son Sam moving to Queensland. It's been such a tough adjustment for me. Uh, I just love him. I love being with him. Uh, and I miss him greatly. I might be the first pastor that could get arrested breaking into Queensland if those borders don't uh, come down by Christmas. But I've had to think um, of, of ways of being intentional of spending time with him to continue to do that because it's so important for both of us. Give time to your children. Invest in them. Sacrifice the time that you need to. Third thing is this, a father... Uh, 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 a third thing is a father requires you know when you look at John three sixteen, it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him we have a role in our own salvation we've got to make a choice we've got to make a decision we've actually got to respond here we, we, we can't pay for, for our own sins but we have the capacity though to believe and this is what our heavenly father requires of us requires an action and in some ways, it's a similar case for us earthly fathers. There's an expectation for his children, a certain requirement. We, we, we shouldn't be doing absolutely everything for our kids. That there's a requirement that, they, that, that, is, that is needed from them. But here's the requirement, dads, of us. That, that we are fully invested. We're doing all that we can do that we take on the level of responsibility that's needed of being a father. Our heavenly father is a perfect father. We, we can't, as dads, reach perfection, but we can strive to be the very best father possible. And that requires a, a, a long commitment. You never stop being a dad. You know, one of the more tragic stories in the Bible is the priest Eli that you read of in 1 Samuel. He's the priest there, but as a father, he just, he didn't invest in his, he didn't do what was required and his children were just out of hand. They'd lost, he lost control in his own children. There's a requirement, yes, of your children, but there's definitely a big requirement that's needed. As fathers, how's your standard going setting that example? That your children want to follow. You know, their time will come where they will be required to make decisions. Who they'll marry, where they'll live, the path that they'll walk. Will they, uh, you know, accepting Jesus into their life or not? Serving in the church, will they be generous? All those sorts of things. But there's a requirement from a, a fatherly point of view that we will do all that we can in guiding them, that we're totally invested. The last thing is this, a father prepares his child for the future. Clearly, it says God made it possible for us to have a glorious future, eternal life in heaven with him. And if we follow his example, then in the same way, earthly fathers need to do what they can to direct their future of their children. There's heaps of areas that we can look at. Money, how to handle money, relationships, careers, and all of that. But I want to finish just with this, of, of how we prepare our child with the most important decision they will ever, ever make. And that's, will they follow Jesus or not? And some of you listening, your child's 44, 54, maybe, I don't know, 34, and they're yet to accept Jesus into their life. I want to say to you, don't stop investing into their lives with Jesus through the actions of your life, through how you go about living your life with what they see. Don't stop. Don't give up. Dads, we play a huge role in this, of being uh, the person that brings them up in a Christian atmosphere. It shouldn't be left to mums. It's so good that many mums do it and grandparents and that, but it shouldn't be left to them. I want to say keep going. You know, as your kids get older, it gets different as I'm learning. But I'm still inviting Sam to do devotions with me. I'm still reading the Bible at dinner time with my kids and doing devotions. We need to encourage them to decide to become Christians because of what they see in and through our life. So a father loves unconditionally. A father loves sacrificially. A father requires of, of their child, but there's a requirement of you dads. 
and the Father prepares that he's speaking and living Jesus into the lives of his children for now and into the future. God bless you today. Take hold of this blessing with you. Those that trust in the Lord, as it says in Isaiah 40, will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. We'd love to see you after uh, we turn off here onto the Zoom foyer experience. But thanks for joining us. It's been so good to have you today. God bless and we'll see you next week.